this presentation, we're going to focus on HVAC controls 101 from basic to advanced. And I'm glad we're doing this. I was kind of thinking of trying to think of this presentation in terms of a newcomer who may be, you know, just coming into this industry and a little bit overwhelmed. And I know I could speak for me when I started in the 90s. The controls was very confusing to me. And I, I, I think it's gotten a little more technical since the 90s, hasn't it? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, just a little bit, right? So we're going to give you a kind of a, what I, what I thought we would do today is give like a bird's eye view of just the basics. We're not going to get down in the weeds of all the technical stuff. Because really, if you don't understand, or at least for me, like I need to understand the basics first, like what's a programmable versus configurable? Why would I use one versus the other? You know, and if you need a deeper dive on any of this information, you could reach out to us or Hobbs or your local rep at any time. We'd be glad to glad to give you more information here. So why don't we start with a quick introduction? And I, I have to tell you, I'm glad we have Kurt and Chris here, which I consider two of the industry top guys. And I, I, I consider true experts are the guys who out there, they actually can program the devices, they can wire the devices, they can troubleshoot and make them work. So this is a great opportunity um, to ask questions of these guys. So it's a pretty rare deal here. So why don't we start with Kirk? Why don't you give us a little, give everybody a little rundown of your, what you do and your experience? Yeah, so I'm, I'm the general manager of the controls department there at Insight Partners. Um, been in the industry about 25 years with about 15 to 17 years in controls. Everything from uh, back when we were pretty much working in DOS all the way up to where we are today. So um, seeing the whole gamut, really, when I kind of came in the industry was kind of as pneumatic was starting to phase out. Um, and so I got to, got to experience pneumatic slightly, and uh, but have been a huge fan of DDC since I've seen it. So um, really looking forward to today's conversations and, and, you know, anything that spurs from it. I think controls is a topic that almost gets avoided sometimes um, be because of people's uncertainties and not really wanting to ask those questions. So hopefully we'll hit on a bunch of those basics today. Yeah, I couldn't agree more for sure. So thanks, Kurt, for being here. And uh, Chris Adams, what's going on? How about a quick intro? Okay, so my role is the Vice President of Engineering for all of our brand partners, so I can support all the different groups. Um, but uh, I'm one of those unicorns, I guess, in the, uh, the <laughs> in the world now because this is my second job after college. So, But I've been doing it for 19 years, so I know we have a lot of folks that move around. Uh, but from the engineering perspective, we get into and look at and try and boil down the controls because I remember the day I got into a into the controls world was I went to a job site, sat down with a controls contractor, really worked through all the details, told them this is how you need to program it, walk away, they program it, and they still did it wrong. So yeah. it was time to say, all right, I got to own some of this. I got to find out what I'm missing in that communication. And so we really look at those controls to focus on how do we communicate in controls? How do we talk about the semantics and how do we kind of demystify what's really going on with controls? Great, great idea. I like it. And I, it's funny when you were explaining that, I was thinking, you know, we've been doing a lot of psychometrics presentations on our shows. And, you know, for me, it all starts, like, if you don't understand the fundamentals of psychometrics and how equipment works and function, it's really hard to understand the control sequences as well. At least it was for me. So starting with that. Um, okay, so moving along here. So why do we need all these controls? Wouldn't life be simpler without any controls on the units? Chris? So when you think about this, and the reason we put this together, it's higher efficiency comes with complexity. Mm -hmm. um, that need for, again, I, I always pick on ASHRAE and the DOE. And the reason that when I'm teaching around, I said, so you can have any conditions you want in your space as long as you use zero energy and no refrigerant. <laughs> <laughs> so as we're kind of right. getting to that, we're getting the refrigerant charges lighter. We're having to be more efficient. We don't yeah. have the capability like we did in the past to store the refrigerant within the system. We used to stack refrigerant in specific places within condenser coils and so on. Well, we don't have that ability any longer. So it's very sim it's simply, we're almost at the point where we are running the unit right on the red line. And if anything mm. has a hiccup, we then trip the unit. We have the nuisance trips that we have to deal with. So we're really having to get much more precise on control. So the days of the thermostat by itself are not something that's going to be conducive to that energy efficiency, because even in the residential world, when you think about where we're going, we're having multi-speed fans, multi -speed fans or multi-step fans. We're having multi-step compressors, inverter-driven compressors, a lot of things to really, again, great things to be able to drive that efficiency, drive that performance, but at the same time, it doesn't come with just the capability to turn on a switch. 
Right. And can you educate me a little bit on the refrigerant discussion? I understand the energy efficiency part of it. Could you help me understand the refrigerant side of what you explained? No, when we talk about refrigerants, obviously we have to, I mean, obviously we're taking advantage of the BTU carrying capability of the phase change refrigerants. Mm -hmm. And so, but at the same time, there's a lot of discussions on the change in refrigerant coming at the same time. So Mm -hmm. we have a lot of things on that refrigerant. So we're basically, when you think about what we're doing, all we're doing is really capturing the phase change, but at the same time, we have to store liquid refrigerant in some places and we have to have a gaseous state refrigerant in other places and we want less and less of it. So we have to be very critical on exactly where that phase change occurs. I gotcha. And that's the controllability is we have to very precisely control exactly where that occur- that happens. Got it. Thanks for that clarification. I like the, uh, so we do a lot of posting online and we get a lot of comments of, you know, like we sell a lot of dehumidification equipment, right? That has hot gas reheat. It has the ability to control temperature, humidity, overall load conditions. And we'll post some stuff like that in the, We'll get com- I'll get comments sometimes of along the lines of there's there's so mu- there's too much stuff it's too technical it's overkill and I'm like well if you want to do the things it's doing you have to have these components in the unit right like it's technical for a reason if you don't need that then a thermostat and a little board on a you know on off unit will work fine so um, Kirk any comments on yeah you know this discussion. Yeah. So, I mean, they, they definitely, you're right, Tony, when you don't need a complex system and you don't need to deal with dehumidification, there are still applications that can run off thermostat, but mm-hmm. alluding to what Chris said, even residential systems, everybody, you know, everybody, when they think of HVAC controls, they think about big buildings that are going for energy savings, but we're moving towards everybody. Your, your standard home is going to have a sophisticated control system in the very near future. It's already being done um, in many aspects and the changes to reduce the amount of refrigerant we use, like Chris is talking about, not only is it controlling it, but also catching it whenever it does start to deviate to correct the, the phasing mm-hmm. issue, right? So that we have this the, the state change in the correct location. And that's it's a complex understanding, right? Right. I like the home thing. I, I like when my I go home and the air conditioner's on down, or the heater's on downstairs and the air conditioner's on upstairs. It's yeah. a great dehumidification strategy. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that happens sometimes at our house in the shoulder months. But anyway, OK, so that's a great um, introduction to, you know, why we need controls and the complexity of it and and along those lines. So um, I always like to start with the history. So, Chris, can you give us a little like you've been around a while and I guess we don't want to let Kurt do the history. Kurt, go ahead and take that away, because um, he's the one that uh, really has dug in and loves the history yeah. of this and has dug great. in. Great. So the, for those that don't know it, the first HVAC control system filled an entire room. Uh, we quickly adopted right pneumatics because they already had that strategy in other places and they thought it was the way of the future. Um, due to its sheer size, they realized very quickly that it had to be had to be reduced. So in 1914 was really the first one that did it. And I'm sure we all know the company that it was. But um, they, they came out with that system. It was extremely complex. It took a couple people to operate. Um, wow. and, and now if you think about, Tony, you made the comment about your house. I mean, how many of us control stuff from cell phones nowadays? Right. Yeah. So, so to think that we went from requiring an additional room in a facility just to control some HVAC equipment to now we control entire buildings off cell phones is, you know, leaps and bounds ahead. So, yeah. So the 1914, is that the uh, print print facility that was being controlled, yeah, the humidity to keep the, yeah. it was like, that's supposed to be the godfather, the first commercial air conditioning system. Correct. That was just the, the first idea. And then again, they adopted pneumatics because they'd been around 100 years previously, right? Um, and started adopting them for HVAC. Oh, okay. So, I did not know that. Yeah. Yeah. Pneumatics uh, came about in the 1800s. So, oh, early okay. 1800s, yeah. Gotcha. Now we've got some pictures of some cr- controllers here. The old time mm-hmm. clock. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's painful for me to see a time clock. I will say that thermostat on the right, I have that one in my house so that I can control the temperature. So we don't have the heating cooling issue you were talking about, Tony. That's yeah. why I have that thermostat bottom right corner. So so most of, well, if you're my age, you know, I grew up in the 70s and 80s. We had the two on the left, you know, in those in those years. And I remember the mercury in the in the little thing there, which I which I'm assuming expanded and connected to contactors. Is that what that? Mercury did. Yeah. The mercury, when you'd watch the bulb shift and it would literally touch two metal plates Mm -hmm. and those metal plates would either put it in heating or cooling. Gotcha. 
Now I had temperature the one of the spring. In, what's that? What's that? It was based on the temperature of the spring. As the spring moved, it would rotate that around for you. Yeah. And and tilt the mercury. Yep. Gotcha. Yep. That makes sense. Now I had a pool that had a couple pumps and had that timer on there in the middle, which I hated. <laughs> it was really hard to it was really hard to work. So I should have probably got a digital one. So um, so anyway, when we say electromechanical, um, how how long have which one of these is are all uh, the ones? Um, I know which one is for sure is electromechanical. Are the two on the left considered electromechanical as well? Or I, I would think they would still be electromechanical. Just again, like Chris said, the springs and it's it's metal closure, metal contact closure that would cause the twenty four volts essentially to pass to change the mode. Mm -hmm. So electromechanical means. It's got electricity and there's some mechanical gears or springs or something going on in the in the deal there. So now that came before or after pneumatics. Uh, this all came after pneumatics. Oh, OK. Yeah. So I'm going to go to this slide here. So um, so when I started in the 90s, this was DDC was just starting to change out all the pneumatic stuff like in the field. Like we get calls, you know, there'd be a VAV box with pneumatic controls and we were changing it to DDC. So can. So one of you guys give listeners, including me, because I didn't know much about it. I knew there was an air compressor somewhere and there was a bunch of tubes running around. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, there was uh, the, the air compressor there, bottom left corner of that picture. That was the heart of the control system. And unfortunately, if that failed, everything failed. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, uh, it just used pressure. And then very similar to electromechanical, it has uh, plates that adjust and bleed valves and give you air pressure. And then that'll decide whether to be in heating, cooling to, to run your modes. And you can actually see in the lower right picture, you can't make them out, but there's a couple pressure dials in there so that you can actually see the pressure in the system. I gotcha. So it worked off of pressure rather than a digital control, a digital signal. Correct. Is that Correct. how it worked? Yeah. Okay. So I have a question for you. You can clear this up for me. So when I was in high school, there were these sensors on the walls in the hallway, and I always heard air hissing out of them. Was that because of this system? Yeah. What was it doing? Like, what was the purpose of that? Uh, <laughs> it wasn't supposed to do that. No. Okay. <laughs> that's the that's the challenge in pneumatic, and and honestly, that was a challenge when DDC started uh, having a system that has a single heart, like that lower left picture, right? That has a single mm -hmm. point of failure. That was kind of the challenge when DDC first came out as well, because that was how it controlled. Now we've gotten much more sophisticated. Price points have come down. Chip shortages have ended. And um, the, you still have hearts in the system, but everything should be able to run independently. It's one of, the, one of the big things we talk about and promote is that if your heart goes down, everything else should continue to run. Well, in the pneumatic mm -hmm. scenario, like Chris said, if it's hissing or it's bleeding, right, you're mm -hmm. losing air pressure. Your system can't, can't control correctly. And there's nothing worse than chasing a leak because you can't always hear it. Right, right. Gotcha. DDC systems don't really leak, so that's good. They do not. So speaking of DDC mm -hmm. systems, so this is so. Chris, you want to go through what that what does DDC mean? And well, we're, we're going to looking sit at there there? And talk about DDC in kind of an interesting light, is because DDC basically digital control, direct digital control, but at the same time, we think about Kleenex. It's a brand name. DDC, we talk about BAS, we talk building automation, we talk a lot of different terms, which are all somewhat in, now kind of used interchangeably for, I now have a computer as the heart. That mm -hmm. computer brain is now what is running and looking at all of the sensors and deciding what to do. And as Kirk was also alluding to, we're distributing the brain. So we'll have in devices where, it's talking to the main central controller, but at the same time, if we lose connection with that central controller, it kind of keeps running where it was before. And so we don't have that same problem of shutting down. But yeah, we use a lot of different things. These are basically, we're taking contactors and relays and communication and digital signals and BACnet and LAN and all this different communication and put in a computer to really understand what's happening in the building and then depending on the programmer, because this is always the question, the uh, there's no such thing as a bad controller in the industry is the way we look at it. But there are a lot of questionable programs. 
because you think about we take a program and every single one of us have a fingerprint when we're writing a program. And that fingerprint is the way we like to program. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we take the one we like the last time that worked really well, we then copy and paste it and modify it. And when you're in that process of modifying it for a new application, you're likely to make a mistake. You're likely to miss something. And so we do have that process. So when you think about the controls, what's actually gotten more critical on controls, especially when we went to the automation side of it, is commissioning. Because mm -hmm. we then have to check out, are the sensors reading what we would expect? Are they reading reasonably? And then based on that, based on that sensor, we want to drive it into a mode. And does it go into that mode? And you think about, we're just checking the box to say, all right, did our computer program have the right links and work the right way? Because we have a lot of sensors and a lot of inputs that we're having to evaluate to decide what to do to keep that precision, to keep that precise control and to keep that efficiency coming together. Great. So I love it. So let's let's pull back for just a second here for someone who this might look foreign to them, right? So I circled these two boxes here, which are actually the blank as you get them a blank DDC controller, which you can program, correct? Kind of like a hard drive, it's blank. Correct. Is that correct? Yeah, it's completely correct. So this in the, in the hands of me is pretty useless, right? <laughs> this in the hands of a Kirk or a Chris is a very powerful tool. And I think what I like what Chris was saying, and I'll just summarize this this way, you know, the controller is the controller, really the the heart of it or the brains of it is like, the experience of the person programming it, the ability to program it based on their experience. Um, and my experience with that is anything you read out of book is great, but actually doing the hard applications, going out there, doing the commissioning, going through, why isn't this responding right? Why isn't this working? We got to tweak this. So it's a blank slate. It comes um, for you to be able to program it as you see fit per the application. Now there's some other things in this. So this is a this would be like a, a typical DDC panel which we would use to control a piece of air conditioning equipment, right? Like a complex yeah. DX unit. What else would we control with this panel, Kurt? So, th so this panel would typically be any, any sort of unitary controller you're looking at here. That's what the panel we're looking at this picture is. That's it's mm -hmm. kind of one of our designs. Uh, however, the hardware that's in it has much more capabilities than just that singular point of being a unitary controller. It can be the acronyms that Chris started with. It could be a BAS, a BMS. It's a DDC controller. You know, the great thing about the product is that it is a blank slate when you get it. The most terrifying thing about the product for most people is it a blank slate when you get it. Like there's there's no there's no program in there. It doesn't start building it for you. You have to right. build it from scratch. The benefit is after you've spent years, as Chris mentioned, after you spend years building programs and getting comfortable with them, you actually kind of have a database, right? Mm -hmm. You have your own database for this is perfect for an ERU with four compressors, you know, running this. And so you just modify it from there. One of the great things about the DDC that really took us farther than with pneumatics is pneumatics or electromechanical, when we talked about them earlier, we were really only talking about a single point to make a decision, right? The thermostat makes a closure, so we go into heat, or the mm -hmm. pneumatic reads uh, high humidity, so we go into dehumidification. And that's all, whereas uh, with a system like this, you can have multiple variables to decide how to operate the equipment. So um, the, the limit, the, the, the controllability of this is, is pretty limitless, right? We can, you're limited mm -hmm. by your ability to program and by the sensors that you could produce. But uh, we, ha we haven't found anything we haven't been able to build yet, right, Chris? Not yet. <laughs> so uh, we've had some that's taken some thought and taken far more hours than we thought it would, but we've always been able to deliver at the end. Sure, which is part of any learning process, right? So that's the brain. So on the right here, I'm going to circle the you know, these are the inputs and outputs, right? We're gathering data, temperatures, yeah. pressures, whatever. And we're doing some calculation in the hard drive or the controller, the DDC controller. Mm -hmm. We're putting outputs out to turn off and on different pieces of equipment to modulate valves, et cetera. Is that correct? How oh, that yeah. Works? yeah, that's absolutely correct. So, um, uh, you know, the left side, as you pointed out, Tony, is all inputs and that's where we gather our information or our signals. And that could be anything from temperature to humidity, or even if you're thinking a mission critical facility, we could get notification that the generator kicked on, right? Mm -hmm. And so that we, now we know we're running in a different state because we're obviously on backup for the building. 
Um, and then that controls the outputs on, on the right hand side. Um, to, you know, and again, this is years of experience between me and Chris. This is, you know, designed, it's really a big thermostat once you get away from all the, the programming and the logic inside it, when you just think about the information you're gathering and how you're wiring it up. So it is very uh, powerful. It's very yeah, the art of it, if you think about it, is if you actually go back into the computer science and the degrees, they talk about a good control system. If you want to have ultimate stability, you can modulate one thing at a time. Yeah. Well, when you mm. think about a building, when you think about an HVAC piece of equipment, we're never afforded the luxury of one thing modulating. Everything's modulating the outside temperature, the outside humidity, the indoor temperature, the indoor humidity, the load, the people coming in and out, all the different valves in the refrigeration circuit alone. We could have five, six or seven things all modulating at once. And so that's where that sophistication comes in. That's where in the controls realm where the thermostat doesn't work the same anymore because you have to get that all playing in concert. So the best building in the world, you think about the control system, it's the orchestra behind the scenes. It's that mm -hmm. music that makes it work together because during their warm up, it sounds awful. But once they settle in and they're working together, right. you have harmony. And that's really what the right. entire building automation system is really simply just that's all it's trying to accomplish is that simple task of how do we make it all work together. And Chris, is that why commissioning is so important? Commissioning is important because you, you absolutely, that's the conductor in some regard, but you mm -hmm. also have to step back and say, we just need to make sure if I tell it to do this, it did that. Mm -hmm. Because you think about, there's a few IO, there's a few inputs, there's a few outputs. Um, we actually was, I was called yesterday about a project. They've been working on it for a really long time, trying to figure it out. And it turned out to be instead of in wire terminals, 29 and 30, it was in 30 and 31, nothing worked. So, and it just, yeah. they got the light, right? So you, I mean, you'd look at it, it looks like it's in the right spot, but whoever wired it missed it by one. Mm. And so simple things like that, that's what commissioning. And so instead of, I'm not starting equipment anymore. We're basically commissioning equipment to make sure if I tell it to do something, it does something. And that way we can actually make sure it does go through those right steps and mm -hmm. we don't have those problems. How many jobs do we do that actually have commissioning? Uh, well, let me, let's back up for a second. So this controller we're talking about, you know, is not needed on every job, right? This is a very no. sophisticated high end type of controls, but it's great for this conversation. We're going to go back a little bit and talk about just standard configurable controls in a minute. But how many jobs do we do that have a control system equivalent to this that have commissioning on them today? Uh, external commissioning, not mm -hmm. enough. Maybe maybe 20, 25 percent of jobs, you know, uh, internally, we we remote access and monitor, you know, any of these custom controls projects for a few months to ensure that we're working, right. operating and delivering the way we're supposed to. Right. Um, it, it's ironic when most people shy away from commissioning and then you have people like me on my team and Chris, you know, that we all embrace commissioning. We know we also know that the more commissioning you do, the less warranty calls you have. Mm -hmm. right? It reduces the overall back end or the end phase of a project where you're running into issues. You know, commissioning may not always be the easiest thing to get through, but um, right. what it does for us is huge. And I think that's a good note to just generally speaking, like if you're a consultant or you're a contractor, or you're an owner and you're going to do a complex controls job, make sure you choose a company that because none of this stuff is going to ship out of the box and work perfectly, right? Because we're all these are one-off when you're doing complex control systems, right? All these are kind of one-off. You're learning as you go. So the ability to learn as you go, make adjustments, make tweaks is super important. So if you're if you're in the HVAC business and looking to do a job that's going to require these controls, make sure you work with someone who's got that capability. You know, we're not the only ones that do that. I'm just saying, like, make sure you choose someone who's not going to ship you something and you can't find them again, Correct. right? You can't yep. get them on the phone or something because that's extremely extremely important so okay so why don't we talk about like we kind of talked about the most extreme edge of complexity in terms of uh of controls and there's reason why it's complex we'll talk about this in a minute but let's go back a little bit and talk about you know a configurable controller versus a programmable controller we talked a little bit about the programmable a minute ago we kind of got a little ahead of ourselves because i got excited about it but Let's step back and talk about configurable versus programmable. So 
who wants to tell us about configurable controls? So I'll start here because this is kind of going backwards in the regard of what is the intent and tolerance of the project? Because that's really where controls, that's the, basically we talk about, we're talking controls 101. That's the first mm -hmm. question everybody should ask. Unfortunately, right now in the industry, what's the first question we have? Well, what's your sequence of operation? Yeah. Well, it doesn't really matter. What's your intent of the space? Mm -hmm. And what are my tolerances? Can I do something that's 60 to 80 degrees and I don't care about our age? Absolutely. AKA a dog kennel. Or do I have to do something that's a pharmaceutical mixing compounding drugs? And if anything goes haywire, we have to do that. So the concept is really step back and look at it. So this is actually where commissioning can, can, can actually get us in trouble at times because it's a, well, the plans say it has to do this. Well, what's the intent of the plans? Not, hey, by the way, it has to do this at this point. Right? Okay, if we got into that detail, most engineering, most processes, most projects, we're never looking at a piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. We're looking at a system. And what is that system? It's the air coming in, the air going out, the people walking in, the people walking out, the skin, everything there. And so once you understand the intent, we know we've got a control to a certain way. We now know sensors that we need. Then we say, all right, what's the tolerance? How critical is the tolerance? Is plus or minus five degrees okay? It's plus or minus 5% RH. So the tighter, the, the more precise the intent and the more the tighter the tolerance, the more difficult the controls. Now, every manufacturer comes up with a controller. They have their own controller and it's what we call configurable. It has their canned program. They've written this program in such a way that it handles as many of the projects they can think of all hitting it at once, mm -hmm. but it has, it's configurable to do that and to control it. It's the sequences by that manufacturer. They look at the designed intent of what's going on. You have set point adjustments and you have a variation of sensors, whether they're communicating of sensors and set point. That's really just configurable. Um, and then once you get in and so you don't step away from that programmable yet, it's still semi-programmable but the sequence is maybe not as adjustable as you would like. Now, the other thing about that last picture that we actually did have, which is it's a fully programmable controller, but it's only programmable to the person with the right tools and the right passwords. Right. So, Tony, that is not a, con a programmable controller for you. It's a configurable controller. Right. I understand. You don't have the tools. Thank you're goodness. Not able to do it. Yeah, I don't have the tools, nor do I want them. <laughs> and so, but that's where you get the self-proclaimed guys like us that really live, breathe, love the psychometrics. We want to say, we all like that programmable. We like to get to that side of where we can really do pretty much anything. Right. Um, and so, but at the same time, we always talk about the more custom you get, the more cost you also get. Yeah. And so if a configurable manufacturer supply controller is the right choice, it's absolutely one of the best directions you can ever go because it is pretty well vetted. Now, are they going to have firmware updates? Are they going to have updates? Always. I've never seen a car without a recall yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. therefore, we've got that that we have to deal with. But really, that's the fundamental difference of go back to the basics of understanding controls is, how do I want to control this room? How do I want to control this space? And how tight do I have to control it? Very good. So that would be, so just to recap, the intent is our objective in the space in terms of temperature and humidity. Is that correct? It can be, but it, again, you think about it. It's like, well, we have, I mean, that's where, again, I, I like picking on ASHRAE because I'm, I work, work with ASHRAE a lot within society. I'm actually society, go to all the meetings, all that kind of stuff. But it says, you think about in our industry right now, Oh my gosh, it's 65% RH. So that doesn't tell me anything because right. what we have that whole chart that said it's got to be 30 to 60% RH. No, well, it depends on the application. Mm -hmm. It's always dependent on what you're going. And so the people who do come in and say, hey, by the way, we got a problem at 65% RH, and that's all they tell you, it means they don't understand it's relative to temperature. And without the temperature, I did not hear anything. You didn't actually tell anything because I had a service call one time and said, hey, we have a serious problem. It's 36% RH. It's way too high. Yeah. All I was told. I'm like 36%, great. All right. In their defense, it was supposed to be 30%. Mm -hmm. But the temperature was 48 degrees. 
Right. It's about a 23 degree dew point, if I remember. Very low dew point, right. And so in, in their defense, it was supposed to be 55. So what did I tell them? Turn on the heat. We yep. just need to warm it up. So just having relative humidity or being scared by relative humidity and being scared of the psychrometrics doesn't really get us there with what the true intent is. We want to understand what are we trying to really control? We have spaces we try and control to 75% RH. I had yep. one that was interesting. A, a, a customer came to me and said, hey, we need 7% RH because they were so used to talking RH and they started telling mm -hmm. me about the intent of their application. And after I dug into it a little bit, they did want 7% moisture content in the product, mm -hmm. which was about 35% RH in the space. That's where the equilibrium point was. So you have to understand what true RH means and where you're going after it to truly understand the full intent and the full level of control. Because what do we want as controls programmers? Huge dead bands, plus or minus 10. Mm -hmm. What the users want, plus or minus 0 0.1. Yep. Well, if you want plus or minus 0.1, I'm running heat and cooling at the same time. I'm doing a Tony Mormino. I'm dehumidifying by having upstairs and downstairs in different modes. <laughs> <laughs> Patent but pending. That's what you have to do if you want super right. high tolerances. You get into those type of things. And right. as you get more, more and more sophisticated, as those tolerances tighten, you only want to tighten them to what's absolutely required and then if it's required, you figure out a way to make that happen. Right. And sometimes we give them a budget for this tolerance. You're looking at this for this tolerance. Mm -hmm. You're looking at this and, you know, you give them three options. Usually that determines the intent the and tolerance. The description I ever had of that was talking about equipment that's explosion proof. I can oh, make yeah. open flame explosion proof with enough numbers in front of the decimal place. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and nothing comes free, that's for darn sure. So I love the idea of focusing on the intent and tolerance rather than the sequence because we could get there one way, but another vendor could get there another way. But the the intent is still met by doing that. So focusing mm -hmm. on the sequence doesn't. So yeah. So Kirk, any um thing to input on this slide? No, I, I, controllers? I, think, I think covered it. Uh Chris covered it pretty good. How many of our jobs are configurable controllers? You know, we sell a lot of like dehumidification equipment. So uh, yeah. versus uh, custom controllers, 90%. I would say it's a high percentage. It's probably somewhere in that 85% range, 85 to 90. Mm -hmm. It usually uh, just as you know, Chris explained the the intent, right? What do we need it to do? Right. Um, and the and the best controller, honestly, is the best is the controller that can fit your intent and tolerance and cost you the least amount. So if that configurable controller is the right solution then that's what we should roll with. But when it's not for sure, you know, you sit down and you do the same thing. You, you um, figure out what the, what the best uh, controller is for the application. Yeah. It goes back to just keeping it as simple as it needs to be to meet right. the intent and tolerance. I love it. So, right. okay. Well, so this slide is showing another type of programmable controller. We looked at one earlier and we talked yeah. a little bit about what's on this slide, but um, I felt like it was a good time to talk about it. But this is the same thing. This is a fully DDC programmable blank slate controller. Um, so this is the next step up from a sequence, a configurable controller, excuse me, that we looked correct. at before. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. But ju just as the one you showed earlier, we bring information in, we send commands out, right? It's a blank slate when we get it. Um, it gives us the ability to uh, you know, match sequences and intent. Um, but gives us the opportunity to write and create the logic. And, and while that's probably terrifying for some people, um, you know, we, we really enjoy it. I do, I do feel like you have to have a special, uh, special aptitude just to uh, get into the programming side and what it takes. But um, once you get away from configurable and you get to programmable, you get, you increase your options, which again is, is what drives your price up, right? Is you have different interfaces, mm -hmm. you have different ways you can communicate and the flexibility is almost limitless, right? It just becomes, what do you want to do? Um, right. It's uh, it's a, they're great controllers, obviously. Yeah. So. so again, this is another panel and just to kind of break this down. So I, I think what I've circled here is the actual DDC controller, the programmable brains of it. So, so ironically uh, that the top one you circled is the actual brain. Is it really? Yes, okay. it is, <laughs> which is really cool because most of the time you don't get a brain and the display built into one, which is exactly what you're used to seeing. So, right. uh, but in that scenario, 
that bottom panel is what's con it's called an expansion IO module. It gives us more points. Um, so that top one is the brain and, um, which is great. Again, that's more and more advancements in technologies. Who knows what 2024 and forward are looking like, but um, to have a brain with a display like that is huge. So it's built into the display. And so this on the right and then on the bottom, what I circled are both input and output. Correct. Correct. It's Correct. expansion so, board. And then uh, I'm sorry, there's expansion board on the left. And then this is just the terminals where you're just. Correct. Them yeah, we, we just make sorry it easier to, to label, make it easier for guys to wire in the field. Mm hmm. That's nice. So, uh, Chris, anything to add to that? No, that's, we're good. I mean, because even the next page still just shows another model of that. You go to the next page, again, it's still talking about that flexible configuration and layout. <laughs> Same concept. It's just another one. It's just another brain. It's another controller. It's got inputs and outputs. And one size does not fit all. That's the one thing where we want to think about it is, as you're going through this, we really want to say, there, I mean, we, we talk about it as many controls contractors look at it. This uh, they 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 say, well, we got a brand that we use this brand and we do everything with it, which is fine, and that's and mm -hmm. it still does work. But then we look at it as one size doesn't fit all because if you actually look at most controls contractors, they don't have one brand, they have multiple brands, and the reason being is because gotcha. as you get more sophistication, it's like you said, the more sophisticated you get, the more cost you have. And we have to deal with those things in that cost. Good point. I forgot to even mention that. So this controller we're looking at here is the high end of our programmable line, which most controls people have. And then they have a medium grade one, which we looked at before, which may be better for like hospitalities and stuff like that. This might be more of like grow room, surgical suites, things along That's, those nature. And I have, we have a question that did pop up, and this is a fun question for this intent and control. And so the question that came in, what level of detail do we as a controls group want to see from a specifying engineer, assuming they're not a controls expert or controls programmer? Well, most of the cases, not to be too flippant, is we already know that. We know they're not controls experts. Mm -hmm. We know they're intent experts, they're design, they're things like that. And so what we really want to see is just simply the intent and everything else comes with it. And we're a little bit different in the fact that let's say we have a unit and that unit's for makeup air. That's all I need to know is I know it's a makeup air unit. And then I ask the question, all right, what am I feeding and what's the tolerance of the space? So I want to hold between, let's say, 68 and 72 degrees, mm -hmm. and I want it to be dry. I want it to be within that. 60% RH and below. At that point, that's all we need from the specifying engineer to say that's exactly what we're trying to hold. We know what we're trying mm -hmm. to hold. We know the moisture level we're trying to hold. And we now know we're going to look at the sensors that we need to accomplish that. So if we think about it from that psychometric perspective, what's our problem? Our problem is the moisture in the outside air if we're in the southeast. If we're out west mm -hmm. and some place is dry, I may only need temperature. I might not need moisture control. But then I say, all right, I, I'm going to start with that. That's going to tell the unit what to do. What? Because we know what's hitting it first is the outside air. And now we know we want to get it to that space temperature of that 68 to 72 and dry. Mm -hmm. We now know the tolerance and we know all the pieces and all the sensors associated with accomplishing that. And then the last piece we need to know is, how close can we get to that measurement of that temperature in the space? Because there's makeup air units that have no space temperature. And so they just do neutral air all the time. Well, mm -hmm. I always say I don't like neutral air machines. And the reason I, I say that is because where should you measure the temperature? Well, you should measure the temperature as close to the person as you're trying to make happy. Mm -hmm. If it's a hotel hallway, it's in the hallway. If it's at a university, it's probably the dean's office or the assistant to the dean. <laughs> where do we want to measure that temperature? And then that's where we want to put the final control. But if it is a high volume outside air unit or 100% outside air unit, we're going to look at that air coming in first to decide what mode we need to be in. So it goes back to a mode versus control. And we always recommend as few points as you need to control because we can actually mm. see what's going on with just the, the sensors we need to control. Informational sensors, which we see all the time, are uh, one of those things that actually makes controls more complex. 
because the more sensors you have, the more you have to troubleshoot because you don't know if it's part of your sequence of operation or not. And so again, minimize the sensors to do exactly what you need. And then if we need to vary fan speeds, things like that, we know the rest of that because we do know the intent. And from an efficiency standpoint, we drive that. We can drive all those different pieces. So again, it all just typically does come down to what's the intent of what we're trying to control and how what's temperatures and humidities we're trying to hold. Excellent. Great question, Evan Hall, by the way. And if you have other questions, please drop them in the chat. Um, talking about sensors and controllability, what are we looking at here, Kirk? Oh, you have a, a plethora of sensors there, everything <laughs> from temperature to plethora, pressure. the first time that word's been plethora. used on one of our shows, yeah. I think. <laughs> uh, there's, there's quite a few there. Um, they're, you know, one of the nice things with the complexity of the controls is is what we're shifting towards with it, with things we can do. And it's thanks to sensors like this. You have everything from a differential pressure transducer that's your top left corner to mm -hmm. um, pressure, uh, refrigerant pressure transducer kind of right there in the middle. Um, these are the sensors that help us evaluate the system and its operations. And as Chris just mentioned, some of them are used for informational purposes. Some of them are being developed to do more, to be predictive, right? To start paying attention to what's going on in the system. So instead of having reactive repairs, you know, there are a lot of companies, ours included, that are looking at doing predictive maintenance to where we can start to tell you're having an issue, mm -hmm. right? Running analytics. And that's only possible due to the DVC. Right. And due to the sensor development that a lot of these manufacturers have, um, we uh, we do see quite a few in systems. Just about every one of these uh, I see deployed on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. um, they're very common sensors, but they give us the controllability. Right. And the consistent readings, stable readings so that we can control the system and hold those tolerances that we've been talking about. And depending on the tolerances, it depends on sometimes the quality and cost of the particular sensor. Is that correct? Yeah. So the question always becomes when you're talking about intent and tolerances is how important is it really? Right. You know, if mm. we're talking pharmaceutical manufacturing, if we're talking indoor agriculture, if you're talking somewhere that is very critical or something that, you know, we refer to as mission critical, then you need a better sensor. A better sensor just costs more. It just does. Mm. Right? It has a higher tolerance. It comes with a better certification. Um, but if you're in a hotel hallway, like Chris mentioned, we don't need to be as tight as we do in pharmaceutical. Right. Right. So um, that comes in when you sit down and you're going on to Evan's question. We really just want to know intent. If you give us intent, we can figure the rest of it out and then we can talk about it. Right. Mm -hmm. And then we can start to determine and design a control system that will meet the specs for the equipment we need. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Bob Kumar asks, is VFD considered programmable? Well, I will give you the engineering answer as always that people always laugh at me, laugh at me when I say that it depends. It depends okay. on that intent, which is kind of interesting. It says, do we utilize the VFD and manipulate and control the VFD? Absolutely. 100%. If right. we can optimize the airflow because if you go back to some of the energy efficiency studies that started way back when as well, you can sit there and say, we talk about single zone VAV. Mm -hmm. Single zone VAV says provide as little air as you possibly can to meet the capacity or the load requirements of that space. And so therefore, yes, we will then program the VFD to do that and to react to the various sensors. And so we want to understand what that's going through. And so we will absolutely program VFDs. We will program also VFDs to manipulate head pressure and discharge pressure on air-cooled machines. We need to control that because sometimes if you're in cooling, you want more airflow across the condenser to be able to get the heat out. But if you're in a reheat scenario where you need more heat in the space, where you're trying to dehumidify and heat the space, you may actually utilize higher head pressures and so we are definitely going to program how we control those fans and the fan speeds to optimize the performance to meet the intent at the efficiency level we're going after. Excellent. Okay. Uh, thank you, Bob, for your question. Gene Otis, BACnet, is it still used? Absolutely. It is, it is probably the most prevalent form of uh, cross-communication. 
Mm -hmm. um, it's been BACnet MSTP for the longest time. We still see LAN, we still see Modbus, but BACnet is definitely in the forefront. And that's and, actually later in our presentation, we talk about BACnet. Do <laughs> That's right, we do. Um, BACnet IP is becoming more and more prevalent, um, and which is uh, I'm excited about for a couple of reasons. One, so we avoid what's called transmission collision. Um, mm -hmm. And that is essentially, Tony, when two pieces of equipment talk and they hit each other, so they stop talking momentarily. Uh, you don't have that problem in uh, BACnet IP. And then, of course, BACnet IP runs at a much, much faster communication rate. Uh, than MSTP or LAN did. So I was in the industry for about five years until I learned what MSTP meant. What was an acronym for? <laughs> Multi-stranded twisted pair, I believe. Is that correct? No, it's actually um, manager sub token pass. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What am I thinking of? You're thinking of the type of wire used. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So, yeah, because that's what it is. It's a token passing system. So it literally it goes... Who am I? And then somebody else responds, I am. And that's how they communicate. Well, what happens when multiple pieces of equipment try to do that? Eventually, information gets lost. Think about me and you in a room. It's simple, right? Me, you and Chris, it's still pretty easy. We get 30 people in the room and you go, who am I? And everybody starts responding. Information gets lost. Oh, and gotcha. unfortunately, that's what happens. And that's So the MSTP wire is used for backnet MSTP or backnet IP? No, just BACnet MSTP. BACnet IP uses okay. a Cat5 cable, which is a that's what I thought. 18.4 okay. twisted pair. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, I'm learning something today too. So um uh Bob is asking, is Profibus? I don't know if I'm saying that right, still used. Do you guys know what that is? Not heard of that. I, I don't I don't it's know. Not I would something say I've used. I mean, it's something I have heard of. Um uh -huh. some industrial application, but I have not uh in many of these controllers that we have, like it's not one. I mean, most most have standardized on a BACnet. Um, and again, we have a BACnet slide that we can talk about it. So um, we can, once we get to that, I think it'll probably make okay. more sense. And so again, this is just one more example of a different controller and it already has what Evan asked the question is, def we want to define the critical inputs, only use the critical inputs and outputs, and the sensors that we're using should be necessary for the intent to satisfy the intent. Um, I mean, we just, there's, again, the more informational sensors, a technician has to go into a job. And if there's a whole bunch of informational sensors, they still have to evaluate every single one of them. It just costs time. It costs effort and it costs money to be able to work those points. So if you, you if you're truly using the incense, the sensor for it, there's a value to it and it will absolutely make your system. Now you can have redundant sensors and things like that, but at the same time, they, they were part of the intent. Excellent. And intent and tolerance, that will probably come up later after the presentation. And if you're watching this, you can always re-watch this or re-listen to this on the Engineers HVAC podcast, which is the name of our podcast. That might come up a little later too, just so you know, if you want to take note of that. Okay. So we've got a couple of questions here. Um, Rob is asking, what are your thoughts on ASHRAE guideline 36 sequences? Anyone want to take that? I'm not familiar with them. So guideline 36 is really about there is a there within ASHRAE, it is talking about the controllability at times, the commissioning. It's kind of a guide that builds it all into one. Mm -hmm. um, right now, it's still fairly new. Um, if you talk to some commissioning agents, they say it's a daunting task. Um, and so I believe what it interestingly enough is, is the way I boil it down is I love the concept of the guideline to sit there and go through and look at what are we talking about on sensors and things like that. And it does get into a lot with in regard to what is the intent and then, but it gives a lot of guidance on how we satisfy that intent at the same time. So it's very, very detailed. Um, I think it is going to be daunting for a little while. But once you have that built into your system, that's where controls are going. It's kind of that first step to say, how do I make that control so much more sophisticated? So it, it is definitely going towards a more custom control because when you think about guideline 36, what's their goal? What's ASHRAE, what are we driving? We're driving mm -hmm. energy efficiency. We're driving controllability. We're driving that true intent with very tight tolerance. And that's, uh, I mean, and again, that's my, limited experience with the guideline 36 seen my presentations on it reviewed some of it 
but it does talk about a lot of different ways to go after certain things. Um, and then I, we, we always say I've got three rules of HVAC. Um, and I, I haven't shared those here, but the three rules that I work with is all manufacturers make great equipment when applied correctly. Blaming the equipment is admitting it's smarter than you. Mm. Uh, rule number two is what's the low, the easiest way to lower RH, which is turn on the heat. Because you can always lower RH. Right. It might have to be 100 degrees, but you can always get the RH down. And then finally, I always say it's always control's fault. Now, what do I mean That's by right. that? With controls, if you actually evaluate your trend data properly, if you have those sensors, you understand what they're doing, and you evaluate those sensors, mm -hmm. you can always figure out what the problem is. You might not be able to fix it with controls. It might simply be a sensor, which is what we see the majority of the time is, why does a control a system stop controlling? A sensor failed. That's the predominant mm -hmm. number one issue. And so you always look at your sensors of what's going on. So yeah, so guideline 36 is going to be, again, a very detailed, very in-depth view of here's the what people have tried to learn. It's like a, what Kirk and I have tried to learn, and the ASHRAE team has come together with a lot of very sophisticated controls folks and say, here's how we put it on paper. Here's what we've learned. Here's what you need to apply. Here's how you would control that to optimize the system. And it's really an optimization type process. Is the way Thank I you, think. Chris. Very good analysis of that. Okay, let's talk a little bit about integrator versus programmer. Kirk, you want to talk about that real quick? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so an integrator is typically somebody that works in the BAS, BMS uh, market, right? Building automation or building management systems. They tend to pull data and send data back out, giving you a singular front end, right? For you mm -hmm. to um, look at the system. A, a programmer and has the ability to to do the, the exact same things, but also has the ability to write these programs for, from scratch to, to match the intent of the design, right? So the, the difference in the two is while the two individuals probably carry the same certifications, you know, one has the ability to completely control the equipment, whereas the other one typically just sends a value and it's typically mm. going back into a manufacturer's canned sequence. Right. So, hey, we want 72 degrees and 55 percent RH and they're passing those values in. But then the the controller, unitary controller itself is actually making those decisions on what to do and how to do it. Whereas a programmer would be somebody that would actually determine how to operate the equipment based on the attempt to meet those tolerances. Good stuff. Thank you for that clarification. Mm -hmm. OK, open versus proprietary, open protocol versus proprietary. Yeah. Yeah, now, those are. This is a pet peeve of ours because we talk about it. We actually, you, you think about BACnet. BACnet says, well, it's an open protocol. No, not really. It's just a common language of what we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. So if we are, we're all, we're all communicating well on this call because we're all speaking the same language. But if I was trying to speak Spanish, Kirk was trying to speak German and Tony, you're going Italian. It makes it a much harder conversation. BACnet puts us all on the same playing field to do that. So just about every controller is a proprietary controller. They have their own internal communication. And so when you think about this is why this slide is here is we talk just talk about integ uh, integrators versus programmers. This mm -hmm. is the same kind. The integrators are definitely going to focus on these protocols that they can communicate back and forth. That's the data that they're really good at gathering and sharing and sorting, pulling from that manufacturers the data they want to share and sending it on of what's going on. But then that's where the value starts to show up is we've got to have that data because having that data talks about when we can start looking at systems and starting to come to predictive maintenance. Where's where this industry is going? We have a lot of analytics mm. that are coming. And so that's where we sit, you sit there and you think about it from that standpoint of, we always talk about, I only want the sensors that are necessary for control. But that doesn't necessarily say I'm not going to have extra sensors because most of the times you really are because you want to also be able to trend the data, share that data, and then start to predict what's happening based on the data that you're gathering. So because that's kind of where I look at it is the standpoint is I want every sensor that I possibly can get that I'm going to use for some purpose but I don't want just extra information that'll never be looked at, that'll never be used. And so, because if it's just an extra sensor, it's not really gonna do you any, do any good. 
if you're not taking advantage of the data. So you want to take advantage of the data. You want to integrate that into that data collection, store that data so that we can actually start doing some, something with it long term. Excellent. Okay. We talked a little bit about BACnet. What else do we want to cover on that aspect? And I see Lon's mentioned here too. So maybe a few notes on that. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, again, like Chris is saying is BACnet and Lon, they were both communication protocols, right? Um, mm -hmm. And the, you know, the interesting thing is when the protocols first came out, as Chris mentioned, everybody was kind of talking a different language. They were talking their own language, right? And so you, you have a lot of movements now, like where it was referred to as a BTL listed device, meaning that it has a structured communication format so that devices from different manufacturers communicate um, with each other. One of the big things that's coming about, which is getting more and more prevalent is BACnet SC. And SC simply stands for Secure Connect. Um, the security level for BACnet and for communication throughout buildings and across open networks is getting more and more secure. Mm -hmm. So one of the one of the big reasons for that, obviously, is you don't want somebody coming in and tinkering with your system or getting on networks or giving you um, any issues from afar, anybody being able to, quote unquote, hack your system. Um, so you have things that are really getting pushed out like BACnet SC um, that are going to help eliminate those types of issues. One of the big things with BACnet SC is it's a certificate driven security system, which means that certificates expire and they have to be renewed. It does take a little bit of work on the back end and long term, but it'll give you a much more secure system so that you're not uh, viable for any hacking or any infrastructure issues. Excellent. OK, so we're about out of time here, but let's touch base real quick on a few, you know, application specific situations where we would use, you know, custom controls versus configurable. So indoor agriculture, extremely difficult to do with a standard configurable controller. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, the, the tolerances and the, the reaction times for any sort of indoor agriculture is you have to res respond very quickly, right? They mm -hmm. want high temperature. They want high humidity for 12 hours a day. They may shift it going on, but as the room, starts to get out of tolerance, you need something that responds very quickly. And traditional, uh, traditionally, configurable controllers have a rather slow response time. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you definitely need something that's looking at data quickly, sampling multiple points. Uh, the sensor you, you have there pictured on the left, there's typically eight to 16 of those in an indoor agricultural room, and they're being averaged. So you need a system that needs to realize if one of them stops working, it no longer gets to vote. Right. Mm -hmm. you, can tell, you can pull it out of the system. So um, and on top of that, when you start to look at um, situations like indoor agriculture, you're looking at more of a holistic environmental control. Right. While we're seriously concerned about temperature, humidity and CO2, we also have to look at light loads um, and we have to look at watering rates. Right. So mm -hmm. when you're looking at those things and you're factoring all of it, if you can get that information, if you can get the intent, if you can get the communication, you can start to respond faster and see a nice level playing field. And uh, as, as some of these horticulture experts tell us, they just want to see happy plants. And, and while they <laughs> right. it's simple, it's not that simple, but uh, but you can get there with uh, custom controls. We all know what happy plants look like. That's what we you do. <laughs> okay. Chris, what's going on with these? We've got a doe ass system. Yeah, so a no time system square, right is there is configurable controller, pretty simple, pretty straightforward, um, making up air, doing some things, had a little fun with it, and then a real big natatorium unit. Uh, because you think a natatorium unit, when you think about it, is it's a big puddle that's nice and warm that's going to evaporate all the time. We've got to <laughs> control moisture. And so you have to look yeah. at that. But for the most part, a lot of these are actually fairly stable when they look like that. But yeah. then you have a swim meet or you have a somebody starts splashing in the pool, then it's very unstable. So you have a different moisture profile. So you actually have to understand how do I react to that? How do I look at that? How do we control that? And again, it goes back to, I mean, what we think about what's the best unit, the best control system in the world for an owner, one that they never think about or hear about. Mm, they name it. Set it and forget it. That's really what they're looking for. But when we're talking commercial equipment, we're in talking sophisticated applications, the uh, one guarantee we make in the commercial world for any HVAC piece of equipment is it's going to break and it's going to be at the most inopportune time. There's one guarantee. Yep. 
because we have to be able to react and to react properly is really the question is what just happened? How do right. we do that? And how do we go? So that's when you think about where are we going with controls? I mean, you talk about the sensors. We want the sensors that we need to control the system as well as, and when you think about just the system, the system is not just a piece of equipment. The system is the space. It's the entire intent of the space because where is it going with predictive maintenance? We believe is where we're seeing it is AI intelligence. We're going to put in the data that has all of the trending of the, of the sensors that we have, and AI should be able to actually say, well, it looks like your sensor's drifting. It might have a problem. Mm -hmm. It looks like your space is sifting. You might have a problem. It looks like you have a refrigerant leak. It looks like, I mean, so all of that stuff is going to start happening as this, as these analytics packages get better and better. And so, I mean, think about when we talk about, again, go back to the sensors. We know the intent of the space. Why is it not controlling? And what sensors are we going to need to do that? Because one of the hardest things that we do see at times is trying to measure building pressure. Why? Because it changes as the wind blows. How was the building built? It's the entire system. It's just not the building itself. How tight's the building? How do we go? Where do we go? All those kind of different pieces. And so we finish up by saying we, we spend a lot of time with engineers selecting equipment. And then the controls are kind of that afterthought of, well, we need controls with it, don't we? Yeah, we do. No, we actually need to probably spending, be spending as much or more time on the controls selection of what is the right control system for the intent, taking into an account the equipment that we're using, the system, the building, the tolerance, the various aspects. I mean, are we talking a pharmacy? Are we talking an operating room? All those different pieces, because the controls 101 don't make it too complex at the same time as we try to boil this whole presentation down is, what is the intent? And then how, to how tight are the tolerances to make sure that a controls group can then help support selecting the right system for that job. What a great way to end it. Great. Thank you, Chris. And thank you, Kirk, for being here today. We appreciate your time. That was awesome. I definitely learned a few things and I'm sure it was a lot of value to the listeners. So thank you guys. Thank you, Tony.